<laughs> a blackout. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, Melanie and Tim, you now have the co-host ability. All right, attendees are coming in. Hello, everyone. Go ahead and share here. Oops, wrong button. Hello everyone, we're just gonna give it another, let's give it another 30 seconds to a minute. Um, I know a lot of people are trying to get on right now, so we're gonna give them some time to join us before we start. Okay. Looks like we're all good. Hello, everyone. If you could just drop a one in the chat, if you can hear and see the screen, please. Just want to make sure everyone is is here. So we have uh, an exciting um, and special presentation today. Um, just before this, we got a full rundown of our presenters um, experience and I'm super excited um, for this presentation as well. So let's get right into it. All right, so let me go back actually. All right, so welcome everyone. This is NJ Thrives Thursday. So welcome to another Thursday. Um, of the weekly webinar series for New Jersey small business owners. Uh, today, I'm your host, Christian Pichardo, NJSBDC marketing consultant and CEO at Niluma Media. Now, before we get started, I want to first let in a special guest, Melanie Willoughby. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Um, and I'm sure you have a presentation you mentioned. Yes, I do. All right, great. Well, there we go. There we go. Whoops. Uh, okay. Well, thank you so very much. It's really a pleasure to be here with uh, the Small Business Development Centers today. Um, I'm from the New Jersey Business Action Center, and I am its executive director. Um, and we are uh, very, very happy to be here with our partner, uh, the Small Business Development Centers, because we work very closely uh, with the centers on helping businesses every single solitary day. Uh, we are an agency which is part of the Department of State, and we have three offices that help businesses. We have our Office of Business Advocacy and our Office of Small Business Advocacy, which is really where we help businesses from Main Street to entrepreneurs, uh, to helping businesses access a variety of state government resources. And we answer all their questions uh, about navigating government on both the state, federal, and county and local levels. And also we have an Office of Export Promotion that really helps businesses in kicking the tires a little bit about global business activities because you're never too small to be an exporter. Um, and I think it's a very important thing to look into, especially if you're looking about ways to be able to expand your business. So the Business Action Center is the great connector. 
Uh, we connect businesses to all of the agencies and outside organizations like the SBDCs who can help them with their problems. Uh, the SBDCs can provide you with technical assistance and we help to uh, navigate that for a small business by talking to them about what their needs are and then indicating and directing them to the right regional SBDC center. Uh, we can also identify the types of grants and loans on both the federal and state level that the business might be eligible for and then connect you with the SBDC so they can help you with your application. Um, we can also help you with your employee benefits like earned sick leave and identifying any licensing or certification requirements you need to operate because in New Jersey, most small businesses need one. So when we connect you, we're gonna connect you with the Economic Development Authority, Department of Treasury, uh, Consumer Affairs, uh, your county or municipality, um, and get you directly to the person who can answer your question and solve your problem. And boy, does that save you time and money. Um, so you really need to know about the Business Action Center and have us on your speed dial uh, because we can be reached at 1-800 Jersey 7. Now, this is uh, some of the activity that the business advocates help you with, mentoring, financial resources, and navigating regulatory processes, labor and workforce issues, and procurement assistance, which actually can be very helpful to a small business to become a vendor to state government or local government, county government, or school district. Um, and we can absolutely help you with navigating that process. And then the SBDCs also have the technical assistance to be able to continue that navigation. So I want to call your attention to business.nj.gov, which is the business friendly website that we have set up to help all small businesses. So you can go on this website and you can get a uh, business starter kit. Uh, you can get answers to over 100 frequently asked questions. And there's a live chat feature, which is the best feature you're gonna find in state government where there are business advocates there from eight to five on a live chat um, Monday through Friday that are gonna help answer your questions directly. Uh, and if they don't know the answer, they will find it for you. Also part of this website is answers to all your questions about COVID. And I know that uh, the governor has made a lot of um, executive orders, which businesses have to follow. And uh, we will provide you with answers to those COVID questions. And that's at business.nj.gov backslash COVID. And our live chat feature is available here as well. Um, and you know, the governor has just indicated that we still have to ha wear our masks indoors unlike the CDC that said, if you're vaccinated, you do not. But the governor has made that as his executive order. And so we want to be sure that small businesses are aware of it and following those orders of the governor. And so we want you to sign up for the state business news, which is coming to you weekly. And it gives you all the news about the latest state government programs that are gonna impact your business. So you just go to, business.nj.gov to sign up for the weekly news. And it's brought to you by the governor's office, the Business Action Center, the New Jersey Economic Development Authority, and the governor's innovation team. And lastly, I want to call your attention to a new business checklist, which you can download uh, from our Business um, Action Center website, which is at NJBAC. Um, and this checklist, even if you are in business already, is a really good compliance document for you. Download it and go through your business to make sure that you are in compliance. And if you have any questions, go right to business.nj.gov uh, and we will answer those questions through our live chat. And we also, if those questions are a little more complex and you need technical assistance, of course, we will direct you to your SBDC. We have a growth virtual series that is available on our website, which actually is all of the government agencies, 
that are providing you with help um, and the government agencies have done these webinars for us and they are all there on our New Jersey back website. And so you have your SBDC, which does your webinars that are excellent for you on operating your business. The Business Action Center provides webinars on the government agency services that are provided. And it's very helpful to you to know what the government can actually do for you versus just taxing you. No, we actually can provide services, which I think can be extremely helpful. So here's how you reach us once again, um, through our Business Action Center website, through our business helpline, which has Spanish and English uh, through our live chat. And you can always reach out to me directly at melanie.willoughby at sos.nj.gov. And I want to thank everyone for participating today because you're gonna have an absolutely incredible webinar, I know. Um, and I hope that if you need the Business Action Center, that you give us a call, put us on your speed dial, make sure that you call us and don't spend a lot of time trying to navigate government on your own. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melanie. That has to be the best uh, guest speaker presentation I've ever seen. <laughs> oh my, thank you so very much. I appreciate awesome. it. Thank you so much. Um, all right, so let's get back into our presentation. And for today's event, here's what everyone came on to see. And it is Tim Peter, the founder and president at Tim Peter and Associates. He will be presenting expanding from brick and mortar to online business. So um, there he is, just um, a couple quick agenda items to go over right before this uh, presentation. And before we start these events, we like to show our small businesses some quick headline. Um, so this happened, I believe 18 hours ago, 20 hours ago, the SBA to end applications Monday for restaurant revitalization fund. So the US SBA is urging food and beverage establishments to submit their applications for the restaurant revitalization fund by next Monday. So the deadline for applications is May 24th. Um, I'm not going to read the entire article, but that's some great news for anyone who has a restaurant or beverage establishment. I'm going to drop that into the chat, the link to the article, uh, so you can open up um, and read up on that. And now, enjoy the webinar. Thank you so much, Chris. I really appreciate it. Uh, as Chris said, my name is, is Tim Peter. I am the uh, founder and president of Tim Peter and Associates. And with me today, we have uh, <laughs> Margaret O'Donnell. Margaret is uh, from Rutgers and is great and is going to help me get through this. She's going to be monitoring all of your questions in the chat and any questions you may have along the way. So if you have a question, just let Margaret know in the chat and she will bring it to my attention and we'll go ahead and get that answered for you. We have a lot to cover today. And I wanna start with just a really simple thought exercise. We've been living through a generational shift to digital over the last year due to the pandemic. But what I want you to do is I want you to fast forward to next year. I want you to picture that it is May of 2022, and you are sitting there in your office or in your home or in your store or in your restaurant, and you've just had the best year you've ever had. I want you to picture what that's gonna look like. Think about it, what would that be? I've just had this amazing year. Well, how did you get there? And I'd like to think that what we're gonna talk about today is the engine that is gonna help drive you to where you want to go. So as you look at this today, we're looking for things you can do right now to set yourself up for the best year you've ever had. So then May of 2022, you can look back and say, wow, I did everything I needed to do to get to where I wanted to go. Now let's talk about what's been going on and why this is so important. This is data from a company called Shopify. And you're going to hear a little bit more about Shopify in just a moment. 
But Shopify provides an e-commerce platform to small businesses all around the world. And if you will note, in 2017, they had sales through their platform. This isn't their revenues. This is the revenue of their merchants of about $25 billion. And then in 2018, they had about $40 billion. And in 2019, they had about $60 billion, which is great. Except you'll note that their growth year on year went from about 70% in 2017 to about 58% in 2018 to a little bit below 50% in 2019, which admittedly 50% growth in a year being you know, a decline, you're doing something really right. But notice what happened in 2020. Almost $120 billion of merchandise were sold through Shopify in 2019, uh, 2020 rather, with growth of over 85%. Clearly, customers have suddenly moved forward to digital for lots of reasons that we all understand, but in ways that nobody expected. We've seen a decade of growth in e-commerce and a decade of growth in digital in just the last 15 months or so. And so what we wanna talk about is how can you do that for your business? How can you see these kinds of growth rates through your digital channels and help you know, shore up your business across the board? So let's talk about what we're trying to do. Well, I always think of it as the big drive. I think of it in terms of we need to drive visitors to our web presence. We need to drive conversion actions from those visits. And we need to drive the frequency or volume of those uh, visitors and conversion actions to improve our customer lifetime value or CLV. In fact, it's a really simple formula that we're trying to follow. Anytime you think about e-commerce, anytime that you think about digital growing your business, I want you to think this really simple math problem. V times CR times CLV equals money. Now, what does that mean? It means visitors times conversion rate times customer lifetime value equals revenue. No matter what else we talk about today, no matter what else you hear about digital, no matter what else you hear about e-commerce, I want you always to think about, is it growing my visitors? Is it growing my conversion rate? Is it growing my customer lifetime value? And if it's doing one or more of those, that's how it's going to grow your revenue. So let's look at what this looks like in practice. When we look at it in practice, we see that if you get a thousand visitors to your web presence today, and that can be your website, that can be your Facebook page, that can be your Instagram page, that can be your Google business listing, it doesn't matter what it is. But if you get a thousand people to it, whether that's per day, per week, per month, per year, that's your number. And 5% of those folks convert. And each time they convert, it's worth $100 to you. Then that's going to get you top line revenues of about $5,000. And again, for some of you, that might be what you get in a month. For some of you, that might be what you get in a day. For some of you, that might be what you get in an hour. That's okay. What we want to do is talk about how we make those numbers grow. So everything you're going to do is going to be around a, can we increase visitors? If we go from 1,000 to 2,000, suddenly our top line revenues go from 5,000 to 10,000. Or if we increase our conversion rate from 5% to 10%, again, we go from 5,000 to 10,000, holding everything else constant. If we increase the lifetime value, how much they spend from $100 to $200, again, it's 10,000. And of course, if we can increase multiple of these, go from 1,000 to 2,000, 5% to 10%, 200, uh, 100 to 200, suddenly that's $40,000 in revenue off your baseline of 5,000. That's what we're looking to do. And all we're gonna talk about today is how to improve visitors, conversion rate, customer lifetime value, so that you can drive top line revenues for your business. Okay, so, Let's talk about visitors. When we talk about visitors, the first question you should be asking is, visitors to what? When you think about your business, lots of people talk about, or we talk about e-commerce, or we talk about digital, you're gonna talk about your website a lot, which is great. Your website is incredibly important. In fact, it is the most important part of your overall web presence. However, your digital presence has to include all sorts of things that I always think of in terms of the hub and spoke model. 
The hub, the part at the center of it all, is your website and your email list. Those are your owned assets. Those are things that you control, they belong to you, and nobody can take them away from you. They're a huge part of your digital presence. They're the core of your digital presence. At the same time, you also need other elements of your digital presence, which could include a Google My Business listing, could include a Facebook page, an Instagram page, a LinkedIn page, a Twitter page, a YouTube page, third-party sites. So for instance, if you're a restaurant, you know, it might be, uh, it might be open table. If you are a retail shop, it might be Yelp. Uh, if you're a hotel, it might be TripAdvisor. It might be Expedia. And of course, we have to think about the future. Okay, so you're talking about how do we grow all of the various elements we care about of both the hub and the spoke. Now, if this is new to you, and this is the first time you've seen this, what I do not want you to do is look at this slide and say, oh my gosh, I've got to run out right now and get all of these. Don't do that. That would be a huge mistake. Instead, what you need to do is you need to focus. You need to focus on those that are most appropriate to your business and your needs. Okay, so let's talk about a couple of different items that make sense depending on the kind of business you are. Now, a common way to think about businesses is whether you are B2C, meaning you are business to consumer, or whether you are B2B, meaning you sell to other businesses. And there are all sorts of other uh, types of these. You know, you can be B2B2C, where you sell through another business to a customer. You can be B2B and B2C. You can be a network where you're actually selling, or uh, excuse me, uh, uh, a platform where you're selling to either side. You know, you're a two-channel market. And that's all okay. But for now, we're going to simplify this to B2C and B2B. So if you're B2C, you're selling directly to consumers. First, you have to have a website. It's an absolute must, absolutely necessary for every single business. You also have to have an email list. It's the way you are able to connect with your customers directly in their inbox every single day or as often as appropriate for your business. What might be useful for many businesses is a Facebook page or an Instagram page. Which one? We'll talk about it in a minute more, but it really depends on the type of business you are. If your customers skew a little older, if they skew um, uh, to folks who are looking for you know, restaurants or things along those lines, a Facebook page is a really great way to go. Instagram, the audience skews a little younger, and again, restaurants can be a good one. Uh, retail stores can be a good one. Highly visual products can be great for Instagram. Both can work, by the way. You can test and see which works for you. But you want to think about what's right for the specific customer who I'm talking to. And um, when we talk about if you have a physical location, you have a place people can go to, you should be looking at a Google My Business listing. So making sure you can list on Google Maps and on Google itself where you're physically located. Some of the most common searches people conduct today, and we'll talk about this more in a moment, is people asking for things near me. Google My Business, make sure you show up there. By the way, there was a question that came in about, uh, can we get a copy of the slides? You will get a copy of the slides. And once you, get, once you complete the end of program survey, you will receive a copy of these slides. So don't worry, we will get those to you, okay? Now I mentioned that's B2C. What if you're B2B, if you sell to businesses? So for instance, here's a tool and die shop, right? Obviously they've got a website, great. Always have to have a website. You still have to have an email list. Uh, I mentioned myself, I, I am a consultant. I have worked with companies in financial services, in hospitality, in retail, in technology. This is my email list right here, right? I am myself a small business owner. So it's always important you have a, a, an email list so that you can talk to your customers directly. You should also have a LinkedIn page. Notice we're not talking Facebook, we're not talking Instagram. It doesn't mean you won't use them. It means they may not be as important to you. LinkedIn, as we know, is the social network for business people. 
And again, if you have a physical location, you're still going to want a business, uh, Google My Business listing. Uh, you know, here's a doctor's office right here. So think about the fact of where are my customers going to be and how do we make sure we're, we're reaching them where they are. Now, I've said this already, but your website and your email list are by far the most important. So let's get something very basic right out of the way. What if you don't have a website? Well, there's a lot of great tools out there. This is not a one size fits all solution, but here are a couple of good options for you to take a look at. A, if you don't have a website and you don't sell things directly through the web, you know, you have a restaurant where people are going to come into your uh, restaurant, you have a a uh, doctor's office or a veterinarian's office or something where you're not selling physical products. A site like wordpress.com is a great all around website builder. It works better if you don't require an online shopping cart. It's relatively low cost. It is relatively simple to set up. You can just go to wordpress.com and it will scale with you as your business grows. Now, if you sell physical products, if you have something that you actually ship to a customer, you might want to look instead at Shopify.com. It's a great option if you require an online shopping cart. It is also relatively low cost. It is also relatively simple to set up. And again, it can scale as you grow. One thing I like about both WordPress.com and Shopify.com is they are quite popular. And so you don't have to have the skills to build these yourself. There are people who can help you who are out there who are very familiar with WordPress.com, very familiar with Shopify.com to help you get set up to use these and grow your business. So they're not just easy to use platforms that you can do, but there's a whole uh, network of resources out there who can help you if you run into trouble and need some additional help. Okay. Now, of course, along with your website, your email list is your most important owned asset. According to data and lead generation firm Madison Logic, users are 22% more likely to open an email if they're addressed by their first name. So if I send an email to my friend Margaret and I said, great deals at Tim Peter and Associates, she might open. But if I said, Margaret, here's a great deal for you at Tim Peter and Associates, she's 22% more likely to open. We also know that fully 72% of customers check email on their mobile device, and that is the most common way people go online these days. And it's still used, it's still very commonly used by millennials. Uh, by the way, I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say, we've gotta stop beating up millennials. At this point, you know, these are folks who are 25 to 39. They're no longer young people, they are adults under 40. So let's get over the term millennials. They are the largest share of the working population. And for many businesses, the largest share customers. It doesn't mean we want to ignore boomers by any stretch. There's still quite a few boomers out there. They are the second largest demographic network out there. They are also on email. They also use the web. And of course, there's that generation in the middle that nobody ever likes to talk about, Gen X. Hi, that's us, that nobody ever cares about. But there's a lot of them too. They are the third largest generation. And those are folks who are, you know, running from about age 40 to about age 55, 56 right now. So they're right in that, you know, sweet spot of middle age and that can be great customers for you. They Jim, all you're use making email. it hard for us to lie about our age. <laughs> oh, I do everything I can to lie about my age. I'm only 29. I've just lived a very tough life to this point. So all right. So You've got your website, you've got email. The thing you want to remember is there's an old rule of email marketing, which is very simple, which is without a list, you have no one to market to. If you're not growing your list, it is shrinking. Every year, there's something called churn, which means the percentage of people who stop opening your emails or unsubscribe or move to a new job and get a new email address. Those are all very common. Churn averages about 7% a year. So every year that your list isn't growing, it's shrinking. And you have to remember that if you start off with, you know, 100 people on your list in year one, you've got 93 in year two. And then you have uh, whatever 7% less than 93 is in year three. You can do the math. It's okay. But if your list isn't growing, it is shrinking. And without a list, you have no one to market to. 
So you want to think about how do I continue to grow to the grow your list over time? And we're going to talk about ways you can do that in just a bit. Now, once you have a list, you have to think about how you get people to open it. Now, first, there are three elements that you really care about. First is the list itself. And if you think about it, this makes sense. If you send the wrong message to the right person, there's a pretty good shot that they're going to open it. But even if you send a perfect message to someone who's not in the market for your product and service, the likelihood that they're ever going to open your email is pretty much zero. So the most important part is the list. The second most important part is the subject line. What do you say right there on the subject? Because of course they can't interact with the, sub, with the email if they don't open it and they can't open it if you don't see the, the uh, if they don't like the subject. And then of course the message inside is the third most important thing. The message, the offer, what you have to say. So that's what you're thinking about. Do we have the right list? Do we have a good subject line? And do we have the right message or offer? Now I've noticed uh, we've got a couple of questions in Q and A, so let's go ahead and see if we can grab uh, some of these questions right now. Margaret, you want to hit me with a couple we got? Sure, sure. So one question is about Shopify, and the yeah. question is if it is a good option to sell vintage, um, quality uh, jewelry, accessories, and home goods. Absolutely. There's no reason why it isn't. Um, now, you may also want to look at something like Etsy for that, but it's certainly, if you have your own shop, you should absolutely look at Shopify. Uh, it makes it really easy for you to take photos and merchandise that product and write good descriptions for it. Uh, it makes it really simple to get it out in front of people. And it makes it very simple for people to say, yep, I want that, put it in your cart. All you would simply have to note is that obviously each item there are, I assume, limited quantities of, right? You probably don't have, if it's vintage jewelry, you might only have one of a particular brooch or one of a particular necklace. And that's completely fine. You would just make that clear in your messaging that you know only one exists and that's okay. A place where that can be really useful is urgency drives conversions a lot. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. But saying that you've only got one may actually increase your sales because it may show people, boy, if I want this, I got to act now. You might look at saying, hey, every Tuesday or every Friday or every Wednesday, whatever it is, we release the latest release of our new curated offerings for you. So shop on that day to make sure you get the best stuff. Things like that are things you can look at. So that prompted, that prompted another question about um, mm -hmm. Shopify. Is that a good place for a published author or um, WordPress, Amazon, or something else instead? Sure. So for a published author, if you're selling your own books, absolutely, you know, a physical book or an ebook, you can absolutely use Shopify for that. As you might imagine, you're going to get more more traffic and more sales typically through Amazon itself, just because of the volume of sales they're going to get. Um, but I'm gonna talk in a moment about why it's not either or, it's and. There are benefits to each, there are downsides of each. So I would say you would look at both and understand here's the, here's the pros of going through Shopify, here's the cons of going through Shopify. Um, uh, the, the pros being you keep 100% of the sale less the cost of the sale. Um, uh, the, the cons being that you, of course, uh, won't get as much traffic in all likelihood. On Amazon, the pros are you're going to get a lot more traffic. The cons are that uh, shop, uh, Amazon is going to take a bigger percentage of each sale. So you're going to make, depending on how you price the book, I believe they charge, uh, oh gosh, what are the numbers now? I forget. Somewhere between, uh, is it 7 to 15%, I believe, based on the price of the book. Uh, don't quote me on that because I might be wrong. It might be 3 to 7 or it might be 7 to 15. I don't recall off the top of my head. But the point being that they're going to take a bigger slice of the sale each time. And then the third problem is that you don't have access to uh, all the customer data that you would if the customer buys directly from you. Okay, I'm going to give you one more question for now, yep. and I'm going to hold the others because um, uh, I think you may get to some of these uh, topics. So, perfect. Um, program programs to capture um, and market use an email market. So what, what programs do you recommend to do that? Well, Margaret, boy, you couldn't have teed that up better if I'd asked you to. So what if you don't have an email list? 
there are there are lots of good options out there, tons and tons of good options. Um, four that are often good are MailChimp, SendInBlue, Drip, HubSpot. There are others like AWeber. There are others like uh, Emma. So there's a bunch of good ones out there, but I, I limited it to these four for the reasons you're going to see in a moment. Um, first, they tend to be better for small or mid-sized businesses in all four cases. Uh, Drip especially focuses on e-commerce focused businesses. So our folks who were talking about selling vintage jewelry in limited editions, Drip may be a better option for you. Um, HubSpot is much is for larger businesses that are growing that need an all-in-one solution. So you need email, you need a customer relationship management uh, system, you might need a customer service ticketing system. So they they are all good. They just have various strengths or weaknesses. Uh, Mailchimp, Send and Blue, and HubSpot all integrate well with uh, Mailchimp. Uh, Send in Blue, Drip, and HubSpot all integrate with Shopify, and MailChimp kind of does. There are some workarounds that you can make it work uh, because of it has to do with business reasons, not to do with technical reasons why they don't tightly integrate. They all have a form builder, and a form builder is what you need to be able to collect email addresses. And their pricing ranges from fairly inexpensive to moderately inex uh, to moderately expensive. Um, Send in blue is fairly inexpensive to you know, a little bit more expensive. Drip is moderately inexpensive to moderately expensive. And HubSpot is moderately inexpensive to fairly expensive. But it just depends on you know, where you're trying to end up, right? So these are all options that exist. You can absolutely look at AWeber. You can absolutely look at Constant Contact. You can absolutely look at AWe uh, Emma. All good options as well. But these are the things I would look for you know, what kind of business does it serve best? Does it integrate with WordPress? If you have a WordPress site, does it integrate with Shopify? If you have a Shopify site, does it have a form builder? And does the pricing work for you? And when you look at pricing, don't just think about what it's going to cost you today. Think about if I doubled my list over the course of the next year, what will that cost? And is it still economical for me? If I double my list every year for the next five years, what will that cost me? Right? So you want to look at the long-term cost and the long-term return on that cost, okay? But these are four good options. There are others as well. All right, any questions about that before I move on? I don't know because I'm not familiar with these two. So I'm gonna ask you about Wix sure. and Squarespace. Are those programs that are email related? Okay. Uh, they, are, they are both website builders. Um, Squarespace and Wix are both very good tools. They are comparable to WordPress. Um, Wix and WordPress right now, maybe people have seen this in the news, Wix and WordPress have been having a, uh, oh, what's, uh, what's the right word for this? Uh, um, an arm wrestling match, we'll call it to be polite, right? Uh, with one another about who is more appropriate for various businesses and the like. Um, Wix has been around for a little bit less time. It has a couple of limitations that WordPress does not, but WordPress has a couple of limitations that Wix does not. Um, I tend to recommend WordPress simply because it has a larger network of developers associated with it. So if you run into any challenges, there's more people who can help you. Uh, but Wix is certainly a fine product and I wouldn't say anything bad about it. Squarespace is another outstanding product. They've been around for a long time. Um, the only thing I don't love about Squarespace specifically, and this isn't a knock, it's just a fact, is it is its own proprietary platform. So getting your content in and out of it, if you want to move later, can be a little more challenging than if you're on WordPress or if you're on Wix. Doesn't mean it can't be done. It just means there's a couple more hurdles to clear there. But it is an excellent tool. It's dead simple to use. If you know nothing, you can go in and have a website that looks really professional in almost no time at all. As a result, it's not quite as customizable and some of the things to get out of it can get either a little more complicated or a little more expensive, but it's a very good tool. Okay. All right, so let's move on. So once you've got an email list, the next thing you have to think about is local search. Now today, most searches that occur occur on mobile devices. More than half of all searches happen on mobile devices and almost all of the growth, and I will acknowledge this is up to 2019, but almost all of the searches happen on 
uh, mobile, excuse me, all of the growth in search has been happening on mobile, not desktop. Obviously, 2020 has skewed those numbers some. We saw a little rise in desktop. I would expect that the longer term trends will revert now that we can start to go outside again. We know that half of mobile searchers visit the store or location within the same day. If they search for a location like a restaurant or a dermatologist, they have about half search uh, visit within the day that they searched. Uh, half are looking for things like a local business address and about 80% of local based searches on a mobile device end in purchases being made offline. So I did a search for a store near me. I'm going to go into that store. I'm going to make the purchase in the store. Again, that's 2019 data. I do expect that those numbers will be lower going forward, but I do think the, that the long-term trend will revert to some degree where at least some folks will continue to buy from the local shop or go into the store now that they can do that again. Okay, so be conscious of the fact that this is changing a little bit fast. All right. Tim, there was a question uh, that came in about um, Google and location. So is it all right yeah. if I throw that out to you now? Yeah, please. Perfect time for it. Okay. So we have someone who closed their downtown office and is now seeing clients from her home. Yes. But she's been Google verified in the old location and um, is really struggling <laughs> um, to yeah. become verified in the as someone who's working from home now instead. So any yeah. recommendations there? <laughs> this is a complicated one. This is not a 101 question. Um, I run into the same problem. I do not have a physical office space. I work from my home. I've worked from my home for 10 years. Um, and so when you when you set up a, a business where you don't have a physical location that people can visit, you set up what are called service areas. You'll note this is my Google My Business listing. And so I show the areas I serve, but not a physical address. So it's something where you have to, you'll have to set up a separate Google My Business listing and make it clear that this is an alternate location and you have service areas, not a physical address. Notice here it says no location, deliveries and home services only. So you're, you're going to have to maintain, if you're going to reopen your office, you will maintain two separate listings, one for the location where people can go and one for the location that people can't go. If you're okay with people um, going to your home and you want that listing publicly, you can actually uh, inform Google that you moved the listing, you moved the uh, business to a new location. And that's uh, something you do within the listing itself under the manage locations section. Okay, so Google My Business gives customers local information in Google search. You put in your name, you put in images, you put in the kinds of services you offer, you put in your physical location if you have one that people can visit or your service areas. If you don't, you put in your hours, the types of service you offer, uh, things like photos. You really want to focus on making sure your name, your address, and your phone number are present, that your website is present, that the physical location is accurate. This is really key for people with a, a store-based business or a physical location-based business. Let's say you're in a shopping mall and it's an L-shaped shopping mall and the address points to here and your store is over here in the shopping center. You can go in and on the map itself, uh, I'm trying to see it right here, map, uh, view on maps, you actually can place a pin where you your physical store is and that's what you wanna do because it's assigned to Google that you're actually taking care of this, okay? You also wanna to look to make sure that people are giving you ratings and reviews and that you're responding to them appropriately. You're responding to them positively. Remember any review that people leave that you respond to, you're not just responding to the person who gave the review, you're responding to all the people who saw the review in the first place. The response is really for the next uh, customer, not the current one, okay? Next, uh, Facebook business pages provides a digital storefront. It's a free solution. In the slides, you'll have a link to go there. They have specific features for restaurants to list menus, service providers to highlight offerings, and you can put in calls to action to drive customers, drive conversions, good stuff. Instagram, same thing, another good tool, free, incorporates calls to action. Here's the link to it. And it'll have improved analytics that'll help you understand what's resonating with customers. LinkedIn, 
is a great way to show business customers you're, quote unquote, a real company. It's a free solution for B2B focused businesses. Or if you're an employer and you want to help employees find you, it can be a great way to do it. And LinkedIn has an amazing best practices page uh, at this link. Again, this will be in the slides. That's just good insights for any digital business. So make sure you check that out. So you're gonna have a whole list in here of what the kinds of things you could have in your digital presence. But remember, you want to focus. Which are the ones that are most important for your customers to reach you? Is it a website? Is it a Google My Business listing or a Bing Places page? Facebook, LinkedIn, a shopping cart, a scheduling form? We're gonna go into all of these in a minute. Uh, you know, Do you need a YouTube page? Do you need a Twitter page? Do you need to be on third parties? So let's talk about third parties for a second. Why wouldn't you just pick one of these? Forget having a website. You're going to be on Google My Business. You're going to be on Amazon. You're going to be on Uber Eats. Don't worry about it. You don't need a website, right? Well, remember, these folks are the gatekeepers to your traffic. They are increasingly adding tolls on the road to your revenue. Jeff Bezos, who is the CEO of Amazon, has said out loud, your margin, your margin is my opportunity. Meaning anytime you make profits, he sees that as a place for him to open a business and take profit away from you, right? It doesn't make him a bad guy. It just means he's going to play, he's going to play hardball, right? Uh, this is Mark Okerstrom. He's the CEO of Expedia. He has said Google is our biggest competitor. The internet has been littered with the bodies of companies put out of business by Google, right? Except the, one of those bodies was his because he was fired because he didn't come up with a strategy to compete with Google more effectively. And that's Expedia. So you need to think about where am I working with these folks in a way that is most appropriate? It doesn't mean they're bad guys. I want to be really clear. It doesn't mean they're evil. It simply means that you need to approach them the same way that, I don't know, a male Black Widow spider might approach a female Black Widow spider. There's going to be some benefit of working with them, but there's a possibility you're going to end up dead. <laughs> so be really clear about what you're getting into and use them appropriately. But that's why you always want your own website and you always want your own email list. As the old expression goes, don't build your brand on rented land. The landlord can always change the rules on you. And you want to make sure that you have a way, a place to go and a place where you live, that if the landlord suddenly closes the door, you still have a connection with your customers. I hope that makes sense to everybody. Now, how do you do that? How do you connect with them? Well, there's really three things you have to worry about. First, remember that content is, was, and always shall be the king. Your customers have questions that are critically important for them to answer. You want to make sure you have content that answers those questions. Next, you have to remember that customer experience is queen, right? And slay queen, slay. We want to make sure that we've got the right customer experience that makes people want to come back to us again and again and again, and also tell their friends and family and fans and followers on social media about how great we are so that we get even more customers. And if content is king and customer experience is queen, data is the crown jewels. It helps us understand more about customers so that we can create better content and create better customer experiences such that they will come to us again and again and again. Now, where do visitors come from? Three types of advertising. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. You're probably familiar with them, but there's paid. It's what we always think of when we talk about marketing. It's advertising. So broadcast, outdoor, print, display ads, pay-per-click search, things like that. There is earned media like PR or social, so press, organic search, word of mouth, reviews and ratings, social shares. And of course, owned channels are things like your website, your email, your blog, any social pages. I will admit, I put social pages here under owned, but technically they're sort of rented. They're sort of leased because... You own the content, but like I said, they're the landlords. Somebody else owns the walls. They can change the rules on you later. What you're always looking to say is, how do I use these together so that I can lower my cost of acquiring customers? Or as I always like to say it, a good marketer can do for a quarter what any idiot can do for a dollar. Don't just, you don't just have to think about paid. Think about how you can use earned media and owned media to supplement that and drive down your cost of acquiring customers over time. 
Now, we've talked about how you get customers, how you get visitors. Let's talk about conversions. They're your secret weapon. We want to know, did the customer act? Did they buy something? Did they download your lead magnet? Did they sign up for an email? Did they schedule an appointment? Each of these is a conversion, and every single one of them represents economic value, economic potential for your business. So let's talk about how you do it. First, shopping carts enable customers to buy products right on your site. Here's an example of a local store. You can add to cart. You can buy with PayPal right there. Make it easy to buy the product. Scheduling forms make it convenient for customers to arrange their visits. So if you have a business where you don't sell a physical product, you have a restaurant, you have a dentist's office, make it easy for people to say, I want to come in and see you. If you don't have any of those, let's say you're like me, you're a consultant, get a lead form that says, hey, do you want to be on the list and grow the email list so we have ways to talk with them over the long term? And sometimes when you have these, you can use something called a lead magnet. Subscribe to our newsletter, get a $10 coupon. Subscribe to our newsletter, get this white paper or ebook. Give them information that helps them, that trades value. They're giving you something of value, their email address. You give them something of value, a coupon, a discount, a piece of content that they can't get anyplace else, a special experience they can't get anyplace else. All of those are ways to give people a reason to subscribe to your email list and grow your email list. Now, anytime you do these things, you have to reduce friction. You wanna get out of the way of people trying to do the thing that they want. Mark Benioff, who's the chairman of salesforce.com has said speed is the new currency of business. And I think he's absolutely right. The way I say it is instant gratification isn't fast enough. We have to give people the answer they want easily. We have to let them do what they want easily. People are busy. They got a lot going on in their lives. Think about your own life. How much time do you spend worrying about other businesses that you need to buy from? You don't. You only think about them when they get in your way or make it hard for you to do what you have to do. And then you don't think good things. So make it easy for people to do what they want to do. And they're going to come back to you again and again and again. So how do you get people to convert? Well, first, you have to use a clear call to action. You have to make it very clear what you want them to do. If you give them too many choices, more often than not, they will choose none of them. Notice what's happening here. We have add to cart, nice big button. We have buy with PayPal, nice big button. We have add to wish list, but it's smaller. They're not putting so much focus on this. We have more payment options, it's smaller. They have share buttons, but they're small and grayed out. They're making it really clear we want you to add this to cart or we want you to buy, period. Notice what they don't have here is a cancel button that's the same size because that's not what they want you to do. Make it easy. Tell people the benefit of what they will get. Maybe give them another benefit and then give them the call to action. The five critical attributes that you have to think about are size. There's a guy named Fit. Uh, uh, he passed away many years ago, but he got a PhD for possibly the silliest thing I've ever heard of, which is known as Fitt's Law. And Dr. Fitt figured out mathematically that things on a screen that are bigger are easier to click on than things that are smaller. <laughs> I know, right? They gave the guy a PhD for that, right? But think about it. How many times do you see things on a page where every single action is exactly the same size? Which one should I choose? I don't know. But if I see this one's kind of big, that must be the better one. This one's a little smaller. That's good, but not as important. These are smaller still, less important. Use size to your advantage. Placement, see what works on your page. Things above the fold, meaning nobody has to scroll. Things on the left or the right, see which works better for your business. Test different verbiage, add to cart, buy now, learn more, act now, etc. Style, is it a button? Is it a link? Is it a link in text? Test and see what works for your business. And of course, color. Think about colors that work online versus colors that don't. We once ran a campaign years ago for a brand that I worked for where our colors were silver and black and we made all our buttons silver and no one clicked them. And we finally did some user testing to find out what was going on. And somebody said, well, I can't click on that. It's grayed out. What we saw as silver, they saw as gray. It was a silly mistake. We should have seen it. But once you know the brand, you think, well, it's silver. We know. But of course, the customer didn't. We made the button orange, sales skyrocket. So think about what's working from that perspective. 
You also want to make sure you've got plenty of images. Images sell. Look at this picture on the screen. Does this tell you something about this business? Of course it does. Visuals dominate digital. They're really, really key. You can't make them big enough and you can't make them pretty enough. Whatever your budget is for imagery for this year, I want you to right now find a way to double it. If it's zero, find a way to spend some money on it because it will help you sell products. And then of course, think about testimonials. Testimonials inspire trust. They help other people say, oh, this is somebody I wanna do business with. They look like they're credible. They look like they're professional. I get it. If you think about, um, if you were going to a, if you're going to a uh, barbecue and your friend called you on the way to the barbecue and said, hey, could you pick up a jar of hot dog relish for us? We don't have any hot dog relish. And you got to the store and there were two shelves and shelf A had, and you don't know anything about hot dog relish. I picked that because I most people don't have a favorite brand. I'm going to go out on the limb here and say, you probably don't have a favorite brand of hot dog relish. But one shelf has a whole jar, uh, has one jar that uh, completely filled. One shelf, it's almost completely sold out. There are just two jars left. They look the same. You've never heard of either of them. They're priced the same. If you're like most people, you're going to pick the one that's almost picked clean, that only has two jars left. Because what it's telling you is that's the one everybody else likes. Customers, human beings, we're social creatures. We tend to do what other people tend to do. Not always. There's always somebody who says, well, I'm not going to do that. But more often than not, we're going to do what other people do. So think about how testimonials help inspire trust and help people to say, this is somebody I want to buy from. Okay. Obviously, another conversion lever can be price, but I caution you against this. It used to be you could give people a sale price and it was very hard for your, your competitors to respond. Today, your competitors know every single price and so do your customers. We live in a world of radical transparency. The minute you lower your prices, your competitors can as well. And all it does is it makes everybody's prices, to low, prices lower. It, I think of this as something called racing to the bottom. It tends not to be a winning strategy. And even if you can win a race to zero, do you want to? If you remember the old movie War Games, you know, it's a strange game, Professor. The winning move is not to play. Try to keep your prices where you can because really all you're doing is taking profits out of your pocket. Doesn't mean you should never test it. Doesn't mean you should never do it. It just means you want to be smart about it, okay? All right. Next, use data to your advantage. Look at your traffic volumes and look at your conversion rates for every page on your website, for every piece of content you have out there. Obviously, things that get high traffic and high conversion, those are your stars, those are your superstars. Lean into them hard. Put some paid media behind those to drive even more traffic to them. If you get a lot of traffic volume, but very few conversions, then invest and test new conversion actions. Try new calls to action, try new colors on your buttons, see if you can actually improve that. If you have a high conversion rate, but you don't get any conversions, uh, excuse me, high conversion rate, but you don't get any traffic, look at ways to drive more traffic to it. Try an email campaign, try a paid search campaign, try a YouTube ad. And of course, if you have no traffic and no conversions, those are sick dogs. Start somewhere and start fixing it, okay? Or, or you know, send it to live on a farm upstate and focus on the areas where you can win, okay? Now, obviously, we've talked about visitors, we've talked about conversion, let's talk about customer lifetime value. You're looking at ways to increase frequency of purchases. What can you do to get people to come back and buy from you more often? What can you do to increase the average order size? What can you do to get people to buy from you over a longer period? So maybe they only buy from you once. How do you get them to buy from you every year, every two years, every three years? Can you offer a subscription? and look at your most valuable customer types and focus there first. People who've already spent money with you are most likely to spend more money with you. So you wanna keep thinking about how do we, what do we need to do to increase frequency, increase average order size and retain for longer periods among our most valuable customers so that we can grow our customer lifetime value. 
Hey, Tim, we had a question come in, something yeah. I'm not familiar with. So I like to yes. post those to make sure if uh, they're, they should be answered at this point, you know, in time or, you know, relevant to this. We have a participant who says that they have been told to get Sam's cart or ClickBank, and they're wondering your views and if you can explain um, those. So ClickBank, I believe you're talking about affiliate marketing. I'm not familiar with the first one you mentioned. Um, I've not heard of that. It doesn't mean it's a bad thing. It just means that there's a lot of stuff out there. And even those of us who've been doing this for 25 years sometimes miss one or two. Um, but ClickBank, uh, I believe, is an affiliate marketing program where you put links to other people's products and services on your site. And if people click those links, you get paid a portion of the sale. If I'm thinking of the right thing, those can be effective as ways to get additional revenue from each visitor. You do want to make sure that it's complementary to what you offer and you're not sending people away uh, from your site to buy something that would take away from your business. So I wouldn't say don't do it. I would say use it strategically. <coughs> Excuse me. I would also suggest that if you're going to do anything like that, try it in your email campaigns after they've made a purchase. Try it on the confirmation page after they've made a purchase. It is often easier to upsell somebody who's already bought from you than to try to interrupt them in the middle of a sale to say, hey, here's this other thing. So think about how you do it as, as a follow-on and increase the sale after checkout. It's a weird difference for those of you who know retail. It's a very strange difference between e-commerce and retail. In retail, it is very common to put things near the cash register as impulse buys, you know, oh, I'm sitting here getting ready to check out, I'll add this to my cart. And people's average cart value goes up, very common in retail. In e-commerce, when you do that close to the check conversion point, when you do that close to checkout, conversion rate usually, not always, but usually drops because you got in the way of the thing they wanted to do. I was gonna buy a guitar and you asked me to throw in an amplifier, well, now I'm confused because that's a complicated purchase or, or even a set of strings, that's a complicated purchase. But if you say, okay, you bought the guitar, we closed that sale and now we send an email for here's a coupon to buy, you know, buy three sets of strings, get the fourth sets free, that can be super effective in a way that's different than, you know, checking out in the real world. So I hope I answered the question correctly. Uh, I may be mistaken on, on the specific point there, but if I am, just let us know in the comment and we'll get you the right answer, okay? So I said I would finish by one, it is 101 and here we go. Let's just wrap this up. Remember, we're focused on the big drive. How do we drive visitors to our web presence? How do we drive conversion actions from those visits? And how do we drive the frequency or volume to increase customer lifetime value? Our revenue formula is visitors times conversion rate times customer lifetime value equals revenue. Think hub and spoke using your website and email list and associated channels that direct traffic to that website and email list to grow your overall business. When people get there, make sure that you got the right content for them because it's the king. Make sure you're providing them a seamless customer experience because it's the queen. Make sure you use the data from those experiences to learn how to improve your content and your customer experiences overall. Work with the gatekeepers, absolutely work with the gatekeepers, but don't rely solely on them because if they close the gate, you lose access to your customers. Think about the various sources of traffic to your web presence and use them in ways that complement one another to lower the cost of acquiring new business. Make sure you're focused on your, your secret weapon of conversions. Think about all the various ways that you can improve customer lifetime value. And if you do all of those things, I guarantee you, you will be sitting here a year from today in May of 2022, looking back and saying, you know what? We have lived through a generational shift to digital and this has been our best year ever. With that, I wanna thank you so much for all of your time and attention. We are gonna stick around for a bit. Uh, we have plenty of time for questions. So I'm going to turn it back over to Chris for Q&A, but I will stick around and answer as many questions as you might have. Awesome, I do awesome. have a couple of um, uh, quick questions. Can I can I throw them out um, before we hand back to you, Chris? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Okay, perfect. So, um, Tim, I was thrown off by one because I think it may have someone may have gotten caught up in a um, an autocorrect that changed Shopify to Spotify because I thought when 
when did Spotify come oh. up? Um, <laughs> but they sure. um, were, it was related to Google. And if you use, and I'm, I'm guessing they meant Shopify, does it come up in Google search? If you uh, happen so if, to have like uh, that type of a site. If you use Shopify, you absolutely can rank in Google for that. Uh, there are some specific actions you need to take to make sure that you are optimizing for Google correctly in Shopify. But absolutely, any e-commerce platform should allow you to rank in Google. How you do it may vary slightly by the specific platform. But yes, Shopify is very well struck, uh, suited for SEO uh, and showing up within Google. Uh, they do a good job of it. Generally speaking, you have to do the right things when you do it. But yes, you totally can do that. Okay. And last question that I have for you is, um, can you toss anything our audience's way about CRM systems? Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, uh, there's a couple big ones out there. There's HubSpot, there's Salesforce.com. Um, MailChimp is slowly moving in a direction of, of CRM. Um, there's one called Nimble, if, excuse me, for that specifically focuses on, oddly enough, dentists and real estate agents, but can be really popular. Uh, one, you're looking for, will it grow with you? Um, how does the cost work and does it integrate with the other systems you have? How easily does it integrate with the other systems you have? What I encourage people to think about anytime you look at any kind of what we call MarTech, right? Marketing technology. Don't just think of those tools in isolation from one another, you know, of I'm buying a CRM. Look at your entire MarTech stack and say, how do these things integrate to make all of the pieces work better? So look at the cost, look at the features that are most important to you, but also look at how well does it integrate with the other parts of my MarTech stack, my email list, my website, my social media management platforms, et cetera, to ensure that I'm getting all the data that I need in all of the right places um, so that uh, uh, you know, they connect well um, and you're, getting, you're able to use them to their fullest advantage. Fantastic. I did I hope, see. I hope that answered the question. I did see one other quick thing come in about um, QR code and rewards that you um, might recommend. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, full disclosure, not my core area of expertise. So, I'm going to give you some general feedback, but there are better sources of answers for this. Um, what I would tell you is you want to make sure that the data all comes to you. That, you know, any data that you collect about the customer, that they're not simply giving it to you so that they collect data about your customers that they can then target to other people. You want to make sure the data comes to you. And that again, just as I mentioned a moment ago, that it integrates with other marketing technology. Does it integrate with your point of sale system? Does it integrate with your email marketing system? So that any data that they're sharing as part of this, you can actually connect with those customers over the long run and uh, continue to get the benefit of. Perfect. All right. I'm going to hand things uh, back to you and Chris. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. So many great questions. Um, so I think that pretty much wraps up Q and A. Yeah. I mean, if there are other right. questions, I'm happy to, I'm happy to hang around, but obviously if there's anything that uh, I can answer. I'm happy to do so. All right. Let's take we can take maybe one or two more questions if they come into the chat. Uh, let's see, let's see. Uh, I did see one NFP versus LLC for speaker consulting. Uh, that gets okay. into a legal. That gets into a legal area. And I I am not a qualified attorney, I would, I would recommend you speak with, you know, competent, qualified counsel on what's the best thing to do there. Yeah, yeah. What we usually say is we're not attorneys. And even if we were, we're not your attorney. <laughs> right. So it, it, those questions get a little complicated, Dr. Denise. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, it's, it's to, a good, it's out. a it's a good question. It's an important question, but one that yeah. you definitely want to talk to somebody who is a you know, competent, qualified counsel for that. Absolutely, absolutely. So it looks like there's no more questions. Um, so 
I'm going to go ahead and wrap up. Thank you so much, Tim, uh, for a, a wonderful presentation, wealth of knowledge. Um, so again, thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Awesome. So just wrapping up here, um, just so for everyone that's still on the call, remember, we are the New Jersey Small Business Development Centers. We help small businesses grow with zero dollar cost expert business counseling, low to no cost training such as this, and we're powered by the SBA and partners. Um, so if you're looking to get started to get a consultation uh, with any business expert we have across New Jersey, please visit njsbdc.com slash request dash counseling. I'm going to drop that in the chat because, okay, never mind. Somebody uh, from our team dropped it in. So that's great. So go ahead and click on that link, register for some counseling. Doesn't hurt to speak to a business expert, right? So um, remember to follow us on social media at NJSPDC or at NJSPDC HQ. And with that being said, I'd like to end this on a quick little quote. Uh, one of my favorite entrepreneurs here and um, says, business opportunities are like buses. There's always another one coming. So um, I could definitely relate to that. Bunch of business ideas I've had uh, come to mind. One stuck, right? I think I've had five to 10 in the past five years. One of them stuck. <laughs> so um, there's always opportunity, guys. And um, yeah, hope that inspires you. And I'll see you on the next NJ Thrives Thursday next week. Same time, same place. Thank you, everyone. Take care.